Hey guys, welcome to my top tips for optimization any game engine because the most of these actual concepts apply. So just a disclaimer, I do have a series which goes into depth about all these things that we'll mention in this video about the top ways to actually do the optimization. So yeah, have a look at those and I'll leave a link in the description if you want to check that out. But number one is some tips on modeling. So when you're modeling any asset, anything that you've got, it's good to take a look at the amount of polygons or triangles that it's made up of. If you look at the faces, this isn't many because all it is is a box. Now sometimes that people are just often Look, you can see I can add lots of different loops around this model and you can see that's unnecessary. This is really, you know, self-explanatory type of stuff, but reduce polygons where appropriate. You know, the less you have, the better it is as long as you can keep the shape. Just as the same with, say, this box. If we're never going to see the bottom of this box, for instance, and we convert this to... Um, an editable poly in 3ds max and I delete the bottom there you go you've saved yourself um, two triangles or a polygon there because if we just always keep it like that we're never going to see the underside so we don't need to do anything with it if similarly if we've got an object which goes into another object like let's say like this for these two objects we don't actually need to be able to see this side or the other so we can again we can just choose to delete either inside of the boxes and you will never see. Obviously something like this, we could join them up and then there we'd save even more. But so it's similar if you've got a pipe going into something else, you don't need the inside face. It doesn't matter that some of the, um, you know, polygons aren't connected because it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. You can join things up to triangles if you need to. It will, you may have problems in the long run if you're doing animation, if it's something more organic like a character. But it's good depending on the type of asset that you're going to make. If it's going to be sort of a base asset that you're going to see about here, you know, keep it fairly simple and basic, delete um, polygons where not required, and only if it's something like a hero asset or something that you're going to see a lot, will you add more detail to it. And then you can go and create yourself high resolution meshes to do the baking out for the normals. And number two is going to be texture sizing, atlasing and resolution and things like that, especially when it goes hand in hand with the modeling, especially when you look at the size of texture and resolutions of textures. If you can see that this whole canvas here is 2048 by 2048, which is um, a good size for a lot of different textures. You know, these could be things from, you know, walls, floors, very, you know, high detailed assets. And then you go to 1024, which might be good for a lot of different props, things smaller things and you can see that you can fit a thousand and four a thousand and twenty four you know size maps in one two thousand and forty eight um, texture space so you can see that my red fits in here four times now similarly if we go to half the resolution of 1024 you would have a box which is 512 would fit into 1024 four times and similarly they'll be even better for even smaller assets less detailed assets you know reduce the resolution where appropriate because the larger the texture size especially with the more detail on it the bigger the file size will be and when you build your um, files out and run them in the memory it will take up more space. So it's good to author your textures appropriately and you can scale down as you save them out. And especially if you're working in a PBR workflow like something like Substance Painter and you've got maybe three, four maps, five maps per asset that you export you, and you exported them at 2048. Before you know it, you've taken up 20 megabytes in one object. So hand in hand with that is you can do something called texture atlasing. So let's imagine that these two objects that I've got here are they're both separate and they would both essentially have two different maps and they wouldn't, they wouldn't share a UV map. Now in 3ds Max, which I'm sure it's similar in a lot of other programs, if we choose to attach the two objects together and I open up the material editor, you can see that they now, they're now both on one UV island. So which means that these two objects now share one UV map essentially, which so they will share one texture. Well, it depends if you do do it via PBR, then it would have more than one texture. But instead of it having, you know, say this had four in the end and this had four, they would both be together on one map. So they would be four together. So you could essentially, you could add another object here. So let's say, for instance, we added something like a sphere. And what we're doing with the sphere is we choose our boxes and we attach them to the sphere and then we open up our UV editor again. You can see that now 
even though the UV map isn't arranged very nicely, these all share the same UV coordinates. So it's now three objects that share the same thing. So again, you're taking, you're using, you know, the best use of your optimization to condense assets together. So they're all in one space and multiple materials and lots of textures for no apparent reason. So then in this instance, instead of having four 1024s, which would be 2048, which would you might have end up, for, you know, 12 textures, you could have them on one 2048 map or 1024 map. And then you've saved yourself a lot of difficulty in the long run. Something that goes hand in hand with this is that if you choose to build out your game, if you go um, file, build settings, if you go build and run, and once you've built out a game at any one time, you can go to the console, go up to the top of the console here, and you've got a little drop down and then you can show open the editor log and then you can go down to the bottom of this editor log and it will tell you how much each of the actual textures and how much sizes that everything takes up. You can see here, I've almost scrolled down to the bottom of this here and you can see that textures take up 0%, message 0%, sounds take up 28% of this current build and it's a complete size of 43 megabytes. And you can see what's taken up and what overheads you've got on resources. You can see that the sounds I might need to, you know, compress those a little bit, which might be another element to your optimization, making sure that you've compressed the sounds as much as you can, either with audio GG format, MP3, something like that. You don't want to kill your compression really in the long in the long term. Another good way to you know adjust the setting according to what players you might have. If you go edit and um, project settings, then you go to quality. You've got a bunch of quality settings. Now I've customized these quality settings, so I've got my own levels of customization. You can go to ultra and you can knock the different settings down. So say you want to go to low, you might want the textures only to be half resolution. You might want all the special features disabled. You want to maybe disable shadows, keep shadow resolution to very low, keep the shadow distance down to a minimum. You can test this in your game because every time you click it would adjust the settings, you know, if we had something in this scene which was apparent to be able to see it. You want to adjust your settings according to what systems you actually want to reach. So it's a good way to, um, you know, be able to test for different machines. Uh, one thing to care to mention, especially if you've set this object here, had a lot more polygons in it. Say we selected this plane and we look at shaded wireframe and you can see that it's made up of more triangles than is required to make up this object because essentially it should be just two triangles because it's a plane at the end of the day. See, it's got a mesh collider on it, but that's a waste of our resources here because a mesh collider puts the collider all the way over the, you know, the entirety of the mesh. So it will find where the polygons are and then put it over there, especially if you've got a complicated object, which in some cases is fair enough. If you need to do that, that's fine. But if it's a simple object, like say, take this cube or you take this plane, we can get rid of the mesh renderer. And in all cases, you know, for the most part, you can use something like a box collider and that will be um, more optimized, especially if you use a lot of it when it does exactly the same thing because it just puts a box over it because it's a box at the end of the day. We can do the same thing here. We can add a box collider to this because essentially it is a box. So it's about looking at the colliders you've got. Avoid mesh colliders where you can. How Use box colliders, cylindrical colliders, anything like that to sort of slowly optimize your way, especially if you're colliding a lot of stuff in your game. Say you do have a really complicated asset, which is you know, loads of complicated shapes. You could go back into your 3D program, make a really basic, say I wanted to collide. For instance, if I didn't use a spherical collider, on this sphere here and I wanted to let's say make a custom collision for it I could do that and I could use a mesh collider for that but I don't want to mesh collide all this because it's you know it's very high poly and it feels like a waste so what I could do is create a carbon copy of this object so say I took it like this for instance and I reduce the sides on it so I had it like this so you can see it looks somewhat similar but because it's a collision it doesn't really matter but we've reduced the polygon count enough so if we export and bring this into unity now and use this as our collision mesh we can bring that object into unity and put a mesh collider on it and it'll be more optimized than using the original model as the base collider say we've got a lot of different objects in this scene here and I will just duplicate some things over here. And these might be our main walls, let's imagine. And then we could scale this down and say we've got really tiny objects. And I put the directional light towards these objects here. They all cast a shadow. 
And sometimes you'll see in a lot of games, a lot of AAA games especially, that especially with small assets, there's no point in the smaller assets casting shadows if it doesn't really add anything to the game. Because most part, these big assets here, you might want them to cast a shadow because they might be important and they might make your scene look more towards a certain style that you're trying to reach. But say this object here, if I pull it closer to the floor, you know, maybe really that, that asset doesn't really need a shadow because we might have put some ambient occlusion somewhere near there and it doesn't need it. So what we can do is we can select on the mesh, ren mesh render and put, we can take off, um, choose to receive or take off, um, receive shadows, but we can take off cast shadows. So we can just say off. So we can say there that if you were playing a, your game and you maybe had some um, decals or alphas or rubbish on the floor, they don't need to cast shadows because they probably wouldn't have shadows or if you've got really small items in a drawer on a desk there might be no apparent reason for it to cast the shadows but it will be a performance overhead if you do leave them doing so it's really dependent on what game you're trying to create what quality of application you're looking to make we've got a different uh, differentiation we've got static and we've got dynamic batching when it comes to doing some optimization you will see in if i go to game view and we go here you can see the batches for the most part um, items are dynamically batched based on the material that they have and whether they're the same objects. So say the, all these squares here, they all share the same material. So they'll be automatically batched by unity and they'll be grouped into um, essentially sometimes a single draw call. And draw calls are the thing that depending on how many objects you've got, how many um, shadows that they cast, how many times that they um, do certain calculations will add to many draw calls and can bog down your performance so say they all share the same material or they're all the same object they'll all be dynamically batched together into one draw call which is great if you've got objects that all share the same thing now we can do something called static batching which um, if you click on an object and you click on the top and you can choose to set that to static and that'll now be static so you don't want to, it's especially important for objects that won't move or if you want to do light mapping and I'll come on to that after this and what static batching does is that will take everything that's static and everything that shares similarities and that will batch it into one draw call because it'll never move and it will just go a long way to um, saving performance especially if it's on bigger objects which costs, uh, which cast a lot of different shadows and receive a lot of different shadows from other objects. Coming on to um, actual baked lighting, if we go to the lighting tab from Unity, you can go window lighting, is that we've got different settings where we can use the light mapper settings to do baked lighting, which on it bakes lighting and the shadows and the um, global illumination into one single texture. Now, normally if we just add a sun and we don't do any baked lighting, it'll be just real time. We'll see the real time shadows just here. Now, if we choose to use some bake setting and if we set some of these to static like any of these they'll be taken into account when we do our static light mapping unless you take them as static they won't be taken into the light map so if it's big objects like walls and things that are never going to move then take static and bake out the lighting and you know that's great and then you'll bake out all the shadows and all the information into one texture and you don't have to use real-time lighting because the real-time will be a big hit on performance obviously depending on the platform that you're trying to reach and the different quality you're trying to go for but there's other things you can go do you can do the mixed lighting you can use um, light probes and things like that to get around to using baked lighting and dynamic lighting at the same time. Another one to mention is that you can use LODs. So say we've got this one cube here. Then from here, let's imagine that we've got an object which is a sphere. And the sphere here is you can see it in our scene. Great, that's nice and big and it can be that many polygons because we're gonna see it this close. Now, how one um, level of detail mesh works is that when you add the component or you bring it from a 3D program, is that if it's this many polygons this close, that's fine. But say we zoom, say we move out here, it's still the same amount of polygons. And if you're this far away, maybe you'd 
you know, we maybe can't see all the detail in it. It might have some bubbles, some different sort of stripes, something on it which we can't see anymore. So the level of detail can be something where, depending on how far the camera is away, we can adjust and swap the mesh out, depending on how far we are away from it. And that can be then swapped to a mesh which is much lower polygon or maybe have slow resolution textures that can go a long way and it say we go here you can have different levels of level of detail so you can go all the way to an even lower amount so you can almost make it look really blocky at this point because you know over here we can barely see uh, much of the detail so it would be hard to make out so we could reduce it again. Automatically with Unity the further you get away normally from textures it will use something called uh, mip maps and mip maps are just it reduces the quality over distance of your textures to decrease the overhead of everything that's there. One of the sort of last things that I'm going to tie in together and mention is that on your main camera, if if I look at my um, camera here, you can see that I've got a far and near clipping plane. And the clipping plane, if you see in my game view, I can take it all the way down and it will clip away things when it gets a certain distance. So this can be a way to cull objects out of the frustrum and the frustrum is directly where the camera actually looks depending on how far away. So if we didn't want to render things right in the background, we could decrease the clipping plane to take that away. And one thing, like I said, you can mention is you can look at the stats window in the game view to have a look. But another thing to look at is window and you go to profile and you can press play on your game and then the profiler will be able to tell you and you can see based on the profile you can look at the rendering so you can see how many batches and draw calls were saved you can see how much memory was allocated to different things you can see what audio was used and you can see what was taking up the most stuff in the cpu usage so you can look down and you can break each part down so you can see that the camera render was taking up 30 percent of performance at different points and you can scrub across this timeline and see oh there was a spike here so what happened at 37 percent the camera render was doing something it was drawing and it was drawing the geometry that was there in the scene and you can break each element down to look at what might be causing performance dips in each of the things that you're trying to do so it's another good way just to in each level of ever you optimize something optimization isn't just a uh, like a step-by-step -step guide even though i've sort of given a brief one here it's you have to do it from start to finish over and over and just learning stuff as you go along to take each step really slowly and optimize as you go along because if you optimize as you go along there won't be as much to do towards the end because the more you leave to end the more it'll absolutely bog you down and you absolutely and you go crazy these are just some of the top tips that i can give you to you know get the best out of the best level of optimization you can and help your game to achieve the performance that you really want so thanks again for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Cheers.